Yeah, I've been doing IETF since 1994, um, although I've been involved in a number of other organizations too. Uh, if I go, kind of go down the list here between the IETF, the Internet Architecture Board, uh, Confidential Competing Consortium, All Seen Alliance, Open Connectivity Foundation, GEDCOM Steering Committee, EBPF Foundation. Uh, and so I'm familiar with lots of different organizations and I've uh, been involved in forming a couple of those. Um, and IETF is probably the oldest one, certainly the oldest one I've been involved in anyway. And so a lot of the things that we've picked up in the other organizations, we've learned from IETF. And so I have two audiences for this presentation. One is people that might be thinking of contributing to IETF, you know, maybe or implementing an open source project that implements off of IETF. Um, and the other audience is people from other organizations that are newer that says, well, what could we learn from the long experience that IETF has? So that's what this presentation is about, is things that we've learned and uh, the way that we work in the IETF now that's been built up over decades. So if you're not familiar with the IETF, right, if you're, if you're uh, new, then here's a quick overview. IETF is the organization that standardizes many technologies that have to do with internet connectivity, right? So if you think about things like DNS, TCP, IP, um, uh, email, right, TLS, DHCP, all those are IETF products, okay? Now, actually, many of those that I just mentioned actually predate the IETF, right? They actually started off as open source projects and then came into the IETF later, right? So IETF has a number of different areas. We interface with other standards organizations, for example, a number of ones uh, that sit above us that we interface with, W3C, OASIS, and many, many others. On the bottom, ones that are specific to different types of links, you know, Wi-Fi and 3G and so on, we interface with other organizations on the bottom, okay? And so each little colored area is an area that it has its own set of working groups underneath it. And the other grays are other standards organizations that we have liaisons and things with. Okay. So that's IETF kind of in one slide because all the rest I'm going to be talking about the tools and best practices rather than actually what the IETF does per se. Okay. All right. So let's first talk about what the um, ethos is of IETF itself. And you'll see that it actually overlaps hugely with the open source community, and this is sort of by design, right? A lot of the IETF things came from the open source community to begin with, okay? Everyone may participate. There's no such thing as a member of IETF. It is not a member-based organization, okay? No such thing. Um, all work is available for free, right? The finished products and the works in progress. Contributions are judged on technical merits, and success is determined by voluntary deployment, not by things like government mandates, regulation, uh, international treaties, and so on, okay? And so you'll see that those things um, overlap greatly with the open source movement, right? It's a lot of the same ethos, and this is a good thing. Um, the IETF itself doesn't do source code itself, other than for the tools that I'll talk about, right? For the actual technologies, it doesn't do the source. Other organizations do that, okay? In the IETF, there's two types of documents I'll talk about. There's an internet draft and there's an RFC. An internet draft is a work in progress. Okay? That means it can change at any time, and so it's not really a good idea to use it as a, as a reference other than maybe as a work in progress because it could change by the time that you look at it. Right? Anyone in the world can submit an internet draft. Okay? You can usually tell that by the drafts have uh, file names, and the file name starts with draft, and then something that's like a surname, something that's other than draft IETF, okay? So anybody, any of you here could create an internet draft, okay? It's not an IETF document, it's just an internet draft, okay? Um, only some of the internet drafts are actually products of the IETF. Ones that are IETF documents are ones that start with draft IETF, okay? That's how you can distinguish there's IETF internet drafts, and there are non-IETF internet drafts. The IETF ones have draft IETF in the file name. Okay, and we'll talk about the process for that in a second. So these are works in progress, or at least things that are under discussion, whether in the IETF or outside the IETF. The other type of document is called an RFC. It's a request for comments, although that name is sort of uh, uh, historical, right? Uh, because it's um, started way back in 1969, as we'll see. It's an archival publication series. Unlike internet drafts, which can change at any time, once an RFC is published and has a number, it is immutable. You can have errata, but you can never modify the actual document. You can only replace it with a new, with a new document. Okay. Now, a couple of common misconceptions. Um, RFCs are not standards. Some are, right? But there are many RFCs that are not standards. So those two terms are not synonymous. 
Um, standards from the IETF are RFCs, but not all RFCs are standards, okay? And so there's things that are informational and experimental and so on. And it turns out that the tools and best practices are the same depending on whether it's informational, experimental, and standards. So I'm not going to go into details of that unless there's a question, okay? However, not all RFCs are also IETF documents. I talked about not all internet drafts are IETF documents. Not all RFCs are, internet doc are, are, are IETF documents. There's other bodies that also publish RFCs. There's the Internet Architecture Board, which I was on for 11 years. There's the Internet Research Task Force, it's research contributions, and others. And so if we look at the RFC series, let me show you some statistics. If we just look at 2023, you can see there was 173 RFCs that came out in 2023. You can see the breakdown. 146 of them were IETF documents. Okay. That means when we say RFCs tend to be IETF documents, the vast majority of them are IETF documents. And that's why people think of IETF uh, uh, documents and RFCs as being synonymous. But there's exceptions here. I think uh, I've personally co-authored documents in every one of these categories except for IRTF. Okay. But I'm only going to be talking about the IETF stream today. Okay. So I'm not even talking about all RFCs. I'm only talking about IETF RFCs and IETF internet drafts. Okay. The RFC series started back in 1969. That's when RFC 1 happened. The IETF was first created in 1986. Okay. That means there was a lot of RFCs before there was an IETF, and that's why there's a large number of uncategorized, okay. and why there's zero now. Right? Now they're all actually categorized, right? but there's this large number that kind of predate the IETF or in the early days of the IETF before a lot of the process and things that exist now. Um, there's also, uh, if you say, well, if all the numbers start with RFC 1 and count up, it doesn't count up to 9362. There's actually some gaps in some numbers that were reserved that have never been issued. So it's like 187, at least, that are, that are gaps. And so the current number is going to 9500s. Okay? Um, and I think out of that 9500s, um, I think uh, about 56 of them are ones that my name is on. And so you're welcome to ask me questions about the process because I have a bunch of history. So. All right, so if I really oversimplify the IETF process for what the document flow looks like, okay, I can group it in these four categories of states. Okay. Things typically start off by somebody authoring an internet draft outside of the IETF. Okay. And so it has this file name, this draft. Typically, the author's surname, like draft failure, for example, if it's being contributed to the IETF, it says, we sure would like this to be picked up by the IETF. Then the next set of the file name is typically the working group name that's being contributed to, if there is one. Right? There might not be one, and so that might even be absent. Okay? Then something that's a topic, you know, a word or two that's kind of a unique distinguishing factor. And then a version number, like NN would be 0, 0, 0, 1 after that, and so on. So this is just, it exists, but it's not an IETF document. And it may even be presented at IETF. It may be discussed on mailing lists, but it's not an IETF work item. It is not necessarily within the charter of something, but it can still be discussed, okay? subject to the meeting, meeting rules and the mailing list rules. If the working group then agrees that it's a good idea, or in some cases, if the document is discussed and the IETF decides we should create a working group because this is a good idea, then the document or a derivative of it gets renamed to draft IETF. So it might be the only change in the file name is changing the author's last name or names to IETF in the file name, and it'll reset at 00, 0 in the NN, okay? And so you'll see that on a later slide or two. So at this point, it's a working group document and goes through a bunch of iterations as part of the standards process, okay? At some point, we hope um, that that working group document kind of stabilizes and it gets consensus among the community that says this thing is now ready to be published as a standard, okay? At that point, once it has IETF consensus, then it goes into what's called the RFC editor's queue. Okay. There's a production house because the RFC is an archival series that's immutable, right? There's professional editors and so on that take care of the production of RFCs. And so it takes in this internet draft and converts it into an RFC format. Okay. And we'll talk about that. That's the RFC editor's collection of, of, of people. Um, and so it goes into this queue and the authors get a chance to double check that the conversion looks right and the layout looks right and the diagrams look right and so on because at the end of the day, as soon as it pops out, you can never change it. Okay? So this extra due diligence that happens in this RFC editor's queue state. 
Once that processing is approved, meaning all the parties agree that this is the correct conversion and so on, then it's published as RFC with a new number, right? Okay. And at that point, this is not uh, ever changeable again. You can file errata. You can start over with a new version of it, starting over from time from the very you know first ID exists and go through a replacement. So you can have an RFC that obsoletes or replaces or updates another one, but you can never change the original. Okay, it's always there um, for posterity. Okay, and so RFC six one seven four is an example of me setting an RFC, and that's what it describes. I said this is overly simplified. You want all the gory details? You can look for a deeper overview in that document. All right. Uh, all right, so let's talk about formats for a second, okay? Because often in standards, I just say, what format is stuff going to be in, right? Are our documents in PDF? Are they in HTML? Are they in Word? Are they in what, right? Remember that IETF has been around since 1969. How many times since 1969 has the, has the most popular document format changed? A number of times, right? So that means that we don't have confidence that 100 years from now that whatever document format we pick now is going to be the one 100 years from now, right? But we still want it to be readable in some fashion. So we had to come up with a way that says, how do we make something be durable, okay, and still have things that can read the document 100 years from now? What is the, what, what are we going to set in place right now? Because, you know, 1969, we're already more than 50 years old, right? If we got documents that were written back in 1969 that we want to be rendered in like HTML and stuff now. What do we do? So this is the current architecture. Okay. On the left, we have a source format. And this is authors of documents want to write their documents in something that they know. They don't want to have to learn a new document editing system. Okay. So that means there's multiple of them here. We don't say, you have to write your documents in Word. You have to write your documents in, you know, pick your other favorite editor or your other favorite format. No. You can take any of these, and these can be added to over time, right? If something else comes, down, comes along five, ten years from now that's like the new big thing for editing documents in, use that, okay? And so internet drafts get authored in any one of these. You can see you can author it in XML if you have an XML editor. There's two different uh, uh, dialects of that. You can author it in Markdown. There's two different dialects of that. You can author it in Word. You can offer it in, uh, author it in RST or restructured text, which is common in the Linux and Sphinx communities. And you can author it just in plain text, right? Which goes back to 1969, where they started off that way. All of those are valid things to be going through that top part of the loop there. The ID exists and working group document are operating that left side, okay? As far as when the work is being done to edit documents, it's done in a source format, okay? Now, that's not necessarily what the consumer of the document wants to read it in, okay? Even during the initial stages, long before it's an RFC, right? Somebody might author it in, uh, let's say, Markdown, but I want to be able to read it in, say, PDF, or I want to read it in HTML with you know, links and things like that. And so how does that work? Okay. For both internet drafts and RFCs, you have this format um, tree here that tooling supports. Okay. The actual canonical format, right? So if there's ever like a subpoena or something that says, give us the authoritative version of this document because we want to know exactly what it said. The answer is the XML is always authoritative. Okay. You ask the RFC editor, the official copy of stuff, if there's ever a discrepancy between two different versions, two different documents in different formats, XML wins. That is the archival format. Okay. Now, from that one, and there's tooling that converts from the source formats into the XML. Okay. From the XML, there's tooling that says, I can take XML input, and I can render that in HTML. I can render it in plain text. I can render it in PDFA, which is the archival variation of PDF under the profile reference there. Um, and so all of this you can find in RFC 7990. What you'll see as I go through tooling, you'll see tooling for converting from source formats to a canonical format, and then from the canonical format to the publication formats. Now this kind of bow tie shape here, where you have many to one and one to many, means that we don't need tools to convert from, say, Word to PDF and Markdown to HTML and plain text. To, you don't need the whole combination of things because it's you know, N on the left and N on the right, and they can be decoupled with XML as the common language in between them. Okay? And today, those are the publication formats, but 50 years from now, there could be something else that's over there that's the dominant one. Okay? And as long as you have tooling that can convert from XML to their thing, then you can render it in whatever is going to be the viewer, you know, the next big viewer you know, 20 years from now. All right, so that's formats. 
Now, this is the open source summit, and so we like to use GitHub, and so it turns out that IETF likes to use GitHub. It is not mandatory. Working groups do not have to use GitHub, but many do because there's a big correlation between IETF contributors and people that are all in the open source community, and this is a good thing, and the open source community loves to use things like GitHub, and so do document authors, not surprisingly. Okay? So because of that, um, there are some templates for people that create GitHub repositories to do document editing in. Not the source code, but the documents themselves are edited in a GitHub repository. Okay? So there's some templates there that there's a link to it that says, if I'm gonna create a GitHub repository to contain the content of a document, to have pull requests against the document, here's some templates that you're not required to use, but many people do because they're you know, sharing the best practices. Okay? And so an example of a document on the right that's using this, you see, um, the, the templates give the ability to set to type make, and what output, what generates is, you know, the rendered versions of the documents, okay? Based on whatever the source format that you're using, right? So you could say, I want the internet draft template that uses, say, markdown as the source format, okay? And I use that template, and I do some edits of pull request, I type make, and then out pops, you know, the text version and the PDF version and so on, okay? So that's the tooling that exists, and there's the templates. Okay? And you can see links for things like the editor's copy. That means the rendered one built out of the make in GitHub. Okay? There's the working group draft, which means the last one on the IETF site. And I'll show you that page. Okay? And then I can do a diff between them in case the GitHub copy is more up to date than the last one submitted to the IETF. Right? Because the author might be doing a bunch of edits here and say, now I'm ready to push it up to the working group and let them see. So there's some tooling here that the templates make this be really easy. All right, many documents use some formal language for at least part of the specification. Not all, could be English text, but many of them use uh, some type of formal languages. There's some common formal languages, ABNF, MIB modules, YANG modules, XML. Um, all of those on the top set are, part, uh, are things that have information linked from the IETF site for authors. Um, obviously, this list is continually evolving, and so another one that's in common use now is Seabor that's not yet linked on that page. And so here's, like, for example, a website that does you know, validation, syntax checking, and things like that for Seabor as a, as a formal language. Okay? And there will be new ones that appear over time, and this is where you'll see uh, things appear, such so best practices and links to tools for authors. And you'll start to see some of these being integrated onto uh, the IETF websites and things, and so you'll see that in an uh, uh, upcoming slide here for, for at least one or two of those. Diagrams. Now, many people have the uh, uh, slightly outdated view that um, the IETF RFCs all have these ugly ASCII art things. They love ASCII art. That, that was true, and in some cases it's still true, but since the IETF has gone to that bow tie model there where you have PDF and HTML and stuff, it is no longer true that RFCs have to have uh, ASCII art in them. And so diagrams can be in ASCII art, they can be in SVG, or they can be in both. And by both, I mean the text rendering can have the ASCII art one, and the HTML and PDF can have the SVG rendering. Okay? And so the core XML will have both, and the rendering tool will say, I'm going to use the ASCII art one, or I'm going to use the SVG one, or in HTML, I might do both for accessibility reasons, depending on what you have enabled, and I might put them both in there. And so uh, there's tooling to say, how do I generate the ASCII art? How do I generate uh, SVG for, say, a packet format or something? How do I generate uh, those things? And so there's tools for that. How do I validate that the SVG is legal SVG, right? Because okay, it's just a text file, right? And so there's toolings for that. And so, again, all of those are linked from the authors.ietf.org page. And we don't tell you what tool to use. We link to, like, all the popular ones that people have submitted and given us directions to use. Um, but then things like, how do I validate that once it's been generated, it's legal? Okay. Then those tools can be incorporated into the IETF tooling sets, like the, the, the submission pages, the, uh, the GitHub make templates, if you saw that, uh, things like that. Okay. So, yes, we have full diagrams, and you can have you know, color subject to certain you know, constraints and things that the RFC editor sets, right? Yeah. Does the specs have to be in English? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I, I, uh, I'll take that one now, sure. Um, the sp there has to be an English version of it, and the actual authoritative version has to be in English, but there can be alternate translations because the um, intellectual property rights allow for derivative works, and languages is specifically the most common case of derivative works. And so on the IETF site, I know that you'll find all of them in English. 
I think that there are alternate translations. I don't think that the alternate translations are yet linked from the IETF sites themselves. They're on other sites. And so they want to encourage foreign language translations. But the IETF policy is that the authoritative version has to be in English. Okay. Um, that's an IETF statement. A more interesting question is if you ask me about RFCs, because not all RFCs are, 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 are IETF ones. That one's a more interesting question. But this talk is about IETF. And so I'm going to stick to IETF during this talk. And we can have the other discussion offline afterwards. So. OK, good question. All right, so I said I was going to show this is one of the tool sites that is meant for authors to use. Right? This is not how you submit an internet, internet draft or how you submit a document. This is if you want to run that tooling without having to download the tools or you know, compile tools or things on your own, this is already has the tools integrated. So I can take and I can upload here a, a source file in any of those formats that I showed you. And I can say, show me the rendering in any of these things, in text, HTML, the, the, the canonical XML, PDF, or whatever. So I can generate all those on the fly even before I submit it. So I can test what the, what the rendering will look like before I submit the draft to say, this is something we want the IETF to consider. I can already tell what it's going to look like when it goes to the tooling set. Okay. Now, I could do that on my own, but it's a lot easier because it has all the tools integrated into one site here to just use this. Okay. Um, then there's tools on here, things like, how do I you know, diff it with the latest? If I'm going to do an update, can I have it automatically show me a red line copy of what's already up there versus the changes that I'm going to propose? Um, can I do uh, validation against making sure that there's no errors in the, in the syntax of the document itself? Down in the bottom middle, you can see A, B, and F tools. Okay. Remember I mentioned that there was some formal languages, and so there's tooling for some of the formal languages. A, B, and F tools are right here. I can say... I can go into there. I don't have the screenshot for this one. But I can go in there and I can say, I'm going to upload a document that has some A, B, and F in it. Okay? I want it to automatically extract all the A, B, and F out of the document I'm uploading and run all the syntax checker tools on that to verify that I don't have any typos in the A, B, and F that's embedded into the document. Okay? And so right now, you only see that for A, B, and F. You don't see that for the other ones already embedded on the site, and you'll see that coming over time. Yes. The, the two markdown variations that are supported, I so said there's because many different versions of markdown out there, right? There's two dialects that are supported out of markdown. Okay, um, those dialects have all the all the information is embedded in a single file. It's like all concatenated into one master markdown. Okay, so you don't have to do external references just to produce the document. Then on the back end, when you choose the file and you have that markdown in here, the, the, the master markdown, just like you can do this with HTML too. You can embed everything in HTML, right? Same thing with markdown. You can embed everything in there. You upload it here. And then on the back end, this runs the tool that says convert markdown for whichever variation it is. There's two tools one for the two variations, right? Convert that into XML. And then if I didn't choose XML, then run the other tool that says, now that I've got HTML, it doesn't matter whether it was markdown. I want to run the XML to say HTML or XML to PDF conversion and show that. So that's what's happening on the server here when you do the submission. No, and that's because the tools that are being used here are open source tools. This is just doing it for you. You can do the same thing in your GitHub CI run. You can take those same open source tools, run them in your own, and in fact, the templates that I showed you, when you type in make, they do that. That's how they generate those things when you type make, because they use those same tools locally as part of, and, and so as long as you do the make inside your, your document repository CI CD run, then that's actually what most working groups do, is they run those same tools that you would get here um, as part of the CI CD. Okay. All right. I mentioned that that was not the page that you use to actually submit a document to the IETF. That's the page that you're just doing maybe during the editing process, but you're not required to. That's just kind of a best practice, right? Now, if you're ready to submit one, you can see in the bottom right corner, ready to submit, there's an internet draft submission button there. This is not the only place to find it. You can find it from the main IETF.org site too. Okay. And that takes you to here. This is where you're actually going to make a contribution, whether it's for the IETF or not. If you're going to create an internet draft, I mentioned not all internet drafts are for the IETF, right? If you're going to create an internet draft, there's this page here. And you can upload it, and XML is the preferred one to say, pre-generate the XML for it. Um, for some backwards compatibility reasons that they just haven't deleted yet, um, meaning 
backwards compatibility human-wise, right, not, not tool-wise, that you can also choose to, choo to, choose to use a, a plain text one. All that happens on the back end is it runs the plain text XML conversion stuff and submits that, right? And so this is just a, one extra thing. But we want you to do the XML conversion yourself. But if you don't, you can generate plain text and so on. It's just the plain text, of course, you can't generate the fancy SVGs and, and so on. So XML is kind of the preferred thing now is to upload that version of it. And that's what gets archived and, and everything gets generated from there. Once it's been uploaded, then it shows up on the IETF data tracker page for an internet draft. Now, tooling-wise, this doesn't actually know, this page or this tool doesn't actually know whether it's IETF or not, right? It's the same page. You can go to this datatracker.ietf.org and see any internet draft. It just runs on the internet draft repository, not just the internet draft ones. And so, um, and so you see a bunch of things on this page that tracks things like the status over time. You see on the top where there's a color-coded thing. That's many different versions as that last part of the file name iterates from like 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on, different versions over time. And I can see diffs between them. I can get a redlined version of what changed between those versions on, the, on, on exactly which dates and so on. You can see buttons to generate various output formats. Okay? You can see about the third or fourth line down, you can see it replaces. Right? We're actually looking at one for draft IETF TEAT protocol. You can see this one says it replaces draft Schofenig TEAT protocol. See, this is a case where ID exists under the author's name, and it became a working group document. And you can see kind of the, the derivation that this is a derivative work of that particular individual submission. Okay. I mentioned we like GitHub, right? Here's where you have the link to the GitHub repository for the document, if there is one. And the IETF does not have open source projects for the actual code. However, People can put links to open source implementations here. It can be advertised as part of the working group. Here's the open source implementations. We've got three implementations of this particular protocol from different people, different open source projects, and all of them, there's an implementation link right here. Okay. Makes it really easy to say, are there people actually using this? Who's using this? There might be proprietary ones, and the vendor ones won't be linked here, only the open source ones. Okay. So it's, again, it's a way to give visibility and draw contributors into the open source community from the IETF standards process. Um, all right, and then you see things like uh, down here on the bottom, the third button from the left is IPR. And so I just wanted to comment on that one. Um, this is where you can find out if there's IPR disclosures or make an IPR disclosure. You can also make an IPR disclosure as a third party. I think that somebody else has one, has IPR on this thing. Now, sometimes there's a common misperception that only members of the organization or only contributors to the standard have IPR that affects the standard. Plenty of counterexamples, okay? Hence the third-party IPR declaration. There's plenty of cases where a, where a standard has been created or is almost done, and then somebody finds out that somebody that hasn't been participating claims to have IP on that. What do you do? So that means as a standards body, you have to have a process for you know, written down someplace that says, what are you going to do if you find out that there's an IPR declaration by somebody who is not a member or a contributor to the organization? What do you do? You got to have rules around that, okay? IETF is a process for that uh, defined, and there's even tooling to support how do I declare that, because what is important in the IETF is transparency. Knowing the existence of it is better than not knowing the existence, Okay. And so that's what the IETF is trying to say. It's all about transparency. How do we make sure that everybody knows what's out there? And of course, their own legal departments can go and figure out whether it's valid or not. The IETF takes no position. It's just a repository of people that make claims. Okay? And does not try to figure out whether it's valid or not. That's your own legal department and the consuming side's job to define. Okay? But the IETF defined the process for that. And best practice, I would say, is that organizations should have a process written down for what you do in that case. Internet draft, uh, when you look at the HTML rendered form, then it looks like this. Actually, there's two different HTML forms. This is one of them, the one that's called HTML eyes. Okay. And so you can see things like, here's what it looks like in HTML. You can see I can do diffs between versions, and I can choose which version to do a diff between. What changed since the last time I read it in April of last year, for example? Okay, I can do that. Um, uh, and there's plenty of other, I can see other formats and, and different buttons on there. So this is like the rendered form of one of the um, output formats. This is an example of what it looks like if you try to do um, uh, diffs. There's two different variations. There's side-by-side, -side, which is this one. 
and then there's the inline redlined version. Um, you can look at either of them. I just happen to show the side-by-side -side one because sometimes it's more readable. But there's both because different ones are more readable for different purposes by different people. Okay. And so the tooling all has that built in. Once things become an RFC, then the RFC editor, okay, again, the RFC editor is wider than the ITF, right? You saw those other streams here. The RFC editor um, is what has the authoritative copy of the XML and the documents there, right? So if somebody gets subpoenaed about what's the ITF document at the end of the day, then technically the RFC editor is what holds the official copy, right? And so the RFC editor has their built out copies here uh, in different uh, formats, you know, PDF and so on. And it has things like show me all of the uh, IPR disclosures that have been made, whether by contributors or not, okay, by anybody that somebody else has claimed, just so I have the full index and I can make a decision, is this right for me to implement or not? I can ask my legal department to go and do that. Okay? Um, how do I find the contact information? What's the right way to cite it if I'm gonna do some document in another body? Okay? If you're writing a different document that's gonna sit on top of TCP IP and you wanna say, how do I cite TCP IP? You go here and you look at the citations and you can see the citation in different formats and that is the official way to cite the, to cite the documents. Um, the, because in this group, we want more collaboration between organizations, right? We want people to be citing each other's documents, right? So best practice is have a way to figure out what's the right way to cite your documents, okay? Um, I mentioned there was a data tracker page in the IETF for internet drafts. For RFCs, it looks the same, okay? And here you can see this RFC 9334 came from the IETF document that was draft IETF RATS architecture. That was the internet draft format version. And I can even go back and diff what was the final produced version against the, the working draft version. When did this change come in? If I want to see when was this thing introduced, right? If that may even be necessary for some, you know, IPR court cases and things, when did this contribution come in? Very easy to track down, okay. Um, what internet draft, what individual submissions did it come from? And when? All right, last slide. Um, resources. These are some of the main resources to look for. The first one is just an overview of how the IETF works in its standards process. Okay. I haven't gone into a large level of detail there. There's a lot more things, more than just spec editing tools and best practices that's there. The RFC editor.org I mentioned is that's what has the official repository and index of RFCs, whether it's IETF or not. Okay. That's the production system that has the series that's an archival series. The IETF document database is datatracker.ietf.org. It's not the authoritative site for RFCs, but it does index them all. And it has all the history of how they came to be in the IETF. And most of the tools that I showed are somehow linked from datatracker.ietf.org. And that's the one that also has things like links to GitHub repositories for documents and implementations and so on. Authors.ietf.org is, if you want to author something, this is where you go and you find all those conversion tools and the latest ones that are being developed and how do I get links to things and get instructions for how to run them and so on. And then finally, all the tools that I've talked about that the IETF uses on the back end and for the, you know, the GitHub CICD and so on, they're all open source tools. Um, they're just open source repositories that, were, that uh, like contributors, just like anything else is discussed here at the Open Source Summit. And so there's uh, code sprints, there's mailing lists, there's open tools team calls. All these tools are done in the open. These are open source projects. And yes, we welcome newer contributors to the tools for these things, especially if they can be extended to say, what if there's a way to extend this to work for other organizations, not just IETF, right? I mentioned not all RFCs are IETF, right? There could be other organizations that says, we want to use the RFC production series. We've already got tools for you, so consider that. And that's the end, and so uh, thank you for listening. And... Um, I think you just maybe answered the question that I was going to ask about, um, you know, the tools themselves. This is a lot of rich work that your community has put into making it easy for people to, to do this work. Um, you know, maybe you can... To, how long did that take? Because that looks pretty pretty shiny. And what can what can we do to maybe uh, there's steal a large number creatively. of tools? Yeah. Uh, how long did it take to do the tools? I'd say there's enough tools that you have to ask it per tool. I'd say um, since 1969, uh, because you know at the beginning there were all tools around just you know ASCII and things, and so the tools were pretty manual and stuff. And so I'd say a lot of the main tools and stuff came in. I'm thinking probably in the 90s was when you started having a couple of initial tools, but that's where 
Uh, one of the source formats at the time was NROF, which isn't dominant now, but back then it was. Um, and so then you started having NROF to, to plain text conversion tools. And that kind of evolved into, you saw the XML language, right? Because you need to say which dialect of XML. And you saw versions of XML. What's the right, you know, uh, it's not a DTD anymore, but at one point it was. How do you evolve that? And so tools started evolving to say, what's the right XML dialect? Okay, well, now we want XML uh, variations to say, how do, we de how do we tag what language things are in? How do we add support for SVG? How do we add support? Is color okay or not okay? How do we deal with accessibility and all that kind of stuff? All that came in is the evolution of those all through the 90s and 2000s and so. And so some of the tools are still you know, brand new and that's why I showed you on the uh, site there. You can see the ABNF checkers are built into the web page. And other ones are not yet, but there's like a Seaboard as a website. And so all that is just active development right now. Uh, great opportunities for collaboration with open source communities and even other SDOs that would not would make use of those tools. Is there another SDO that wants to use Seabor? Is there another uh, organization that would use ABNF or whatever? Can we collaborate on those tools? So, Dave, I got a question. Um, with the uh, GitHub integration, is the process for going between a GitHub commit that goes to a PR and is accepted? Mm -hmm. Um, to my knowledge, because the, the, the answer could vary by working group and by repository, right? Because you can set up your own rules and things, right? That, that, that's just a template, right? You can customize it, right? To my knowledge, nobody does the automatic submission, okay? There's a, not all working groups use GitHub, but it's becoming more and more common in the ones that I participate in, I'll use GitHub now. Um, I think the HCP uh, uh, working group was the one that pioneered a lot of it, and so some of the templates were first done by the HTTP group. Um, Martin Thompson, you saw his repositories is where the, the templates are, are kept now. Um, and I think even them, they don't do automatic submissions. They do periodic submissions. It's a manual submission. Um, and part of it has to do is something that's ITF specific, right? When ITF has a meeting, right, there's actually a lockdown in the submission process such that the version that people are talking about at the meeting um, has like a, a two-week window where the submissions are closed, right? So that you can all review the same version, right? And so that means if you tried to uh, prevent people from doing PR check-in, then it would kind of harm things, right? So it says, well, you can always do the PR check-ins in a GitHub, but you can't automatically do it because that would like fail right now. And so there could be things in the future that could be done there, but right now nobody does it. It's all manual to submit it to the IETF, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question because I don't think there's a master answer right now in meetings of uh, like there's working group chair training sessions and things where this is kind of one of the discussion topics that comes up. And so there's things that I'm familiar with that people do, and it will probably evolve in the best practices five years from now, will probably be different from right now. But I'd say right now it's pretty common for a working group to have an organization. So if I go back to some of uh, the links that I showed, uh, where's the one that had the GitHub one? Yeah, here. Okay, so if you look in the in small print of the address bar, right, it's github.com, and the organization is ietf-rats-wg, right? So the working group itself has an organization, and so the working group chairs are the organization admins, okay? Then there's a repository, which has the draft name in here, right? This is draft ietf rats uccs as the, rep as the repository underneath the working group organization. And so the repository has its own maintainers, which in this case are the document editors. So that's the best practice that people tend to do right now is the working group has the GitHub org, and then the editors of the document are assigned the working, the, 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 uh, to the actual repository. And so they have the commit privileges there. It's whoever's, the working group chairs designate who the authors are, the editors, I should say, and the editors have merge com have commit permissions on, on the document. And then the working group chairs are then responsible for making sure that there's consensus and judging that, right? But they can, you know, party on the document as the editors, and then they check consensus after that to say, is this the right consensus? Should we tell them, go back and fix the stuff, right? So.
Um, there isn't yet, but that's what I would like it to be. Yeah, and you, there's a good observation that says right now it's under Martin Thompson's repository, and it should be under an IETF one going forward. Correct observation, I agree. Right. Um, I don't think that's there yet, but I think that's where things will will, will go. Right. And so uh, today, to your answer your question, there, to my knowledge, there is not a master IETF organization as an organization per working group um, or per team. So like the IAB would. You know, so an example is. Uh, on the very last slide, I said there was a tools team, which is basically just you know, the, anybody who wants to participate. I said there's no members of the IETF, right? You can join a mailing list, you can post stuff, right? Except as long as you follow the IPR rules, the IPR rule for the IETF is that if you post, you make a contribution, you are obligated to disclose whether you, know, whether you are in personal knowledge of IP, whether it's yours or not, okay? So as long as you follow that, you can post, okay? And so, um, the tools team here is a collection of people, and you can see there's a group's tools. And so you could imagine a repository that's the tools team repository that just has the, the Martin Thompson's templates in it. That's not the case right now, but I think it should be. Martin's probably watching this. Hi, Martin. <laughs> there's people that have forks of it. Things never actually go away. Zillions of IETF contributors have forked that one. And so, the, uh, the, yeah. So, you're, you're right. The IETF trust probably could have a fork of it right now. Maybe they already do. Yeah. Now, it actually is a, it, it is a key concern because um, at one point we had a, a, a tools site that was owned by a private individual, and that private individual then went away. And so we had to go through, well, how does the tools IP, the IP of the tools themselves, who maintains that, and so on. This has already happened once, right? I said, this is a 50 years old organization, right? All kinds of things have happened in 50 years, right? And so we've already had to deal with that once. And so, yes, your, 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 your point is spot on, and we do that with that one, too. I think you already let me go over time, so thanks, yeah. Well, thank you so much for your um, presentation, Dave. Um, I found it very fascinating. Thank you.